consistent with labels that's like a training ground or a solid fan base and those bands that want to stay within their specialist area of music whether it's industrial or hardcore or something else can and those bands want to move beyond that and are capable of doing it can go on to a more sophisticated marketing and sales operation. At the moment, the ones that are on the main label are the ones that have broken the top 20 in this country at least. So uh, there's S Express, Bond the Bass, and Beatmasters. We're both producers and artists. Um, I mean, I don't think we could possibly be produced by anybody else. You know, I mean, the production side of what we do is completely crucial. I think we've found that whole sort of double life thing of artist producer it's more difficult than a lot of other people have come up since because we were one of the first people to um, be sort of doing productions and, and be sort of seen as artists in our own right and uh, I think like the record companies have found it quite hard to deal with that it's a new formula they don't, they don't really know how to um, how to market it when we started out the music critics did used to give us quite a lot of flack about being um, commercial, as they called it, in other words, having success with what I think people were very precious and kind of snobbish about dance music then because it was uh, still very much an underground thing and we were bringing it into the overground, into the mainstream. And of course now it's ridiculous because it is completely the mainstream, you know, absolutely 100%. I feel that a lot of people in, in the uh, music press actually only realised that anything was happening in dance music after some people started breaking through commercially. So I think what happens is that they're obviously not only that keen on us who've actually broken through and had sort of commercial hits because um, they've got nothing new to write about. The Nexus Express release is um, remix EP, uh, remixes of Fine and Fallen by Band of Gypsies, remixes of Let It All Out, which is a track off the forthcoming album. The reason the second album has taken so long is because when we released the first track of it, Nothing to Lose, it went to number 32 in the charts, which, was, um, which wasn't you know, very good for us. And uh, we realised that it was definitely too early to release something like that. People would have just heard it and thought, I don't get it. The name Splish is actually um, a cross between Splendid and Swish. Hence the name Splish. All the releases have a certain vibe about them that are um, they're kind of unusual. But they're all they're all quite uplifting, they're all quite uh, they kind of move you in one way or the other. Basically Splish Records is just an extension of my record collecting. Uh, I can actually collect the artists now. <laughs> Grotheim is YBU and uh, he wanted a singer and a songwriter so we've met through mutual friends and he was invited to my 21st birthday party. We sat down and we had a chat, talked about our musical influences and um, the weekend after we went into his squat where he was staying and we did a track in about four hours. And the first record I bought was Brass in Pocket and it's my favourite from that day to all this. Um, I also was very much into Blondie. <laughs> I'm not afraid to say that. <laughs> I like James Brown and Diana Ross, all the old Motown. I'm quite into soul music, I think, really is my main influence. In a rhythm is more ravey with vocals, and I'm awfully chart bound stuff. One Tribe is a collaboration of phrases with different musical influences, and we got together, hence uh, the track. Yeah, now. My musical influences are uh, jazz, funk, the old days, some soul, a bit of reggae. Basically now I'm working on a new release and um, I've got a few other um, projects coming up in the future. On Art of Rhythm we, um, we like to keep away from the rave music but we like to release more hard dance and hard techno. Basically, um, we release 80% of the RNS stuff that comes from Belgium. We release, we release it on our RNS UK in conjunction with Outer Rhythm. So, um, not all of this stuff, but about 80% of the um, material that comes from RNS. I started making music when I was 13 and uh, I ripped apart 
keyboards that I could get hold of until I had a, a knowledge of how they worked. Then I used the knowledge to build my own keyboards. The didgeridoo sound was created entirely from electronics, which I had built, and not from the samples. Travellers used to come to the raves which we held, and uh, so we used the didgeridoo sound, and we made the track really fast, so that we could kill everyone off at the end of the night, so they wouldn't have any energy left to keep on dancing. Didgeridoo was one of the six tracks to do that. There were five other tracks, but they might be released until next year, as uh, they're deemed to be mad. On Transglobal, there are four stroke five artists, which are Sheep on Drugs, uh, Baby Ford, C, Joy, and KMFTM. Uh, they're all album artists, as in one or single artists, uh, mainly working live um, across all different types of areas of music. Before nine, uh, it's um, it's like a circle, you know. It's like it started off the other extreme to what house and techno is understood to be, and it ended up back at house and techno. As far as techno goes, there's a commercial side to it, there's an underground side to it. When the commercial side becomes mainstream, the underground develops into something else. And that's, that, you know, the underground is the interesting part. B49, um, yeah, it's finished. I plan to retire. Why do I make records? Because I wasn't good at football. I think what uh, musicians or people, you know, who want to develop their music forget is how important their personalities are and their ideas. Because the main thing you're really trying to do is not sell your music, but sell their ideas and their personalities to other people who make the decisions to back them. It doesn't have that much to do with talent, interestingly enough. It doesn't mean the people who make records aren't talented, but it's the way that it's used that's really significant.
last couple of years, all the people that were in Leeds that went to dance music used to go off to Manchester or Sheffield or go get out of Leeds. There wasn't much going on, but there's a lot of good nights now. And Chaos has always been going up and high flyers and back to basically, I mean, there's, there's loads, there's loads going on now. The whole idea behind Back to Basics, really, like, for the more discerning clubber was we weren't trying to do anything too pretentious, we just wanted somewhere where we could go. We had a good crowd of people right from here from the beginning, and now we've got people coming, uh, we've got a great possible coming from Dum yeah, Durham, Tynham, we people from Liverpool, Manchester, Blackburn, Nottingham, whatever, and it's those sort of people that are making leads now. Music quality of Back to Basics is just quality. We're not snobs, we don't say you have to play American House. Uh, we're not techno heads at all, it's just quality music from around the world, whatever me and Ali like at the moment. The point about music policy is that we've got two floors. Upstairs we try and make like a disco floor, a bit funkier, a bit more laid back. And downstairs we've got a better sound system, so we house it up serious. When we first started going to the Hacienda and starting breaking into warehouses and putting PAs in and partying and things, that was punk rock. That was a, an all new cult generation that started, it was exciting. And now it's just all gone so mainstream, there's no angle, it's not different to go out raving. I remember like the newspapers slagging it off like mad, and now, you know, they're fully behind it all, you know, like they've got their little charts in there, they've got Pete Tong putting his top ten in there and everything, and it's just, the punk aspect was just to try and get that angle back to make it slightly different again. Don't you want me? Lisa came and did a night here about a couple of months ago now, and she's probably been one of the best DJs we've had on as far as the crowd's concerned, so I thought it'd be a really good idea for her to start a regular girls' night. I don't think there's been too many uh, female DJs uh, up until now, purely and simply because of the chauvinist attitude uh, within the dance scene. Girl DJs have this tendency to say, to sort of just play, you know, good tunes rather than try and be so fresh all the time. If you're into music and it, it might be a boy or a girl, you know, at the end of the day, a DJ's a DJ. Back to Basics is a pretty strong door policy. It was initially dedicated to those in long trousers and sensible shoes. We're not trying to be posy by saying, like, we want people to look in a certain manner. We're just doing it for the good of the club, you know. If you turn up at the club and you've got a baggy T-shirt on, a pair of shorts, and an art, you know, it's our public duty to say that nobody should look that stupid. If you come to the club, don't let your mother dress you. Don't let your mother dress you. The history of Nightmares and Wax goes back from five years ago when me and Kevin met from great dancing and body popping. And from that, me and Kevin met up, become DJs together and created Nightmares and Wax as DJs. And from DJs, we went on to making music into like tracks like Let It Roll, Dextrous and Stating a Fact. And then we brought out his own EP on like Poverty Records and that's when we came up with the record deal. Our influences are from the 70s funk and also like the, the early jazz as well and a touch of soul and all, with all these influences this is what comes out in this music. What people will get off, off like our new stuff will be a total surprise because it's totally different from what we were doing before but I don't think they'll be disappointed and if they are, well, they are. The difference between a rave scene and like a good dance music scene with the rave, it's more a commercial thing, and dance music is, a, is an underground thing. One thing I like to point out about the rave scene is, uh, is like, the majority of the crowd that are into rave, of like, the, the more or less brainwashing for that thinking is just that, and when it comes to actual good quality music, like the garage, and the things you don't want to know, and that's the sad thing about it, like I said. There's a lot of good underground DJs, especially on the pirate stations in um, like Chapel Town and all that, I believe which are playing the, the good underground music and do vary the music from like soul, hip hop and house and jazz as such. Um, but the Pirates are still, I think they still need more support as well. I was about 12 years old when I started rapping and it was just a bit of an hobby really, I used to rap to myself while I walked streets. Issues that I rap about is either 
social issues or personal experiences because I feel that I should write about things that I know about and not, not things that I don't know about. That's why I rap about myself. I think both black and white people, a lot of people assume that rappers are black, but for me starting off as a white rapper, at first it's like you have to prove yourself. After a while you get the respect and you get accepted because if you're good, you're good. And that's all there's to it. The Herb Garden is a fanzine which we set up because basically there was nothing representing the scene up here. We're getting a lot more contributors now, but I, I write about 75% of the stuff that goes in it. With us mentioning like the drug, the drug scene, the, the drug culture, we thought we'd take a responsible approach and like we, we got in touch with like, people like the Bridge Project and these drug advice people, and they were ha happy to give us leaflets. And they've even put advertisements in, because so we feel that. Although we talk about it quite a lot, we talk about it in a way that it tries to educate rather than just glamorise it. Uh, the club scene in Leeds has changed. People have got away from dancing like a straight get for four hours in a sweaty club with just a t-shirt on. People are now growing up and dressing up and having a good time and getting back to talking again. Like we don't play any rave music, any house music at all. It's like mainly rare groove, funk and soul, and like lots of old theme tunes. It's mainly an older crowd, like I would say like over 20, 25. Uh, people are like dressing up. Flares, wigs. People will just like wear that thing that they just had in their wardrobe that they just wish they could wear that they just never get out. Uh, people really make an effort. that it was sold personally rather than out of the vending machine because the whole club is based on a personal approach. People automatically presume that I'm somebody's girlfriend and that I'm an accessory. I mean, I might be, like, perpetuating that in some way. No, but because I'm selling something and I'm dressed up. But there's obviously a lot more to it than that. I mean, I'm running the club and a lot of people, people don't realise that. Utah Saints started in March 1991 by myself and DJ Tim met up, both DJ in the same club but on different nights. Uh, I'm fundamentally a musician, Tim's fundamentally a DJ. We see ourselves as a band and we're not just a faceless studio act and we're not just two guys standing behind keyboards. There are four of us when we play live. Sampling gets a bad name, um, generally speaking, from bands that tend to take the essence of someone else's record and then try and make it into the essence of their own record. What we're trying to do is use samples as instruments. That, at the moment, is quite a hard idea for people to get their sort of heads around. Well, we use such well-known artists in our records, Kate Bush, uh, Annie Lennox, Gwen Guthrie, um, because, well, basically, we like the vocals, we respect them as artists. Um, but there again, we do have to pay for that privilege, which is quite a high price. Arcus started last summer, summer in 91. It was very different from other nights. You know, other nights are very specialised a lot of the time. Hardcore techno nights, garage nights, very specialised. What we've always tried to do is stick to a policy where we play, play the best of every different sort. Well, from the start, we decided to um, concentrate on trying to help local DJs. Rob Tazera, Gary Norman and Mark Holliday. We decided to use female bouncers because obviously if, if you're a young woman it can be very intimidating to be searched by a nasty big gentleman who, who perhaps should, is not being as careful as perhaps he should be. We were the first club in Leeds to search on the door. Um, ticket only, so it's always sold out. Um, everything's scanned. It's very strict, over 18s only. Well, the drug scene has made rave successful. The music is totally reliant upon drugs, whether that's good or bad. What we have to do is make sure that an event like ARC is in the safest possible manner. And from the venue's point of view as well, a mixture of young, young, young kids and, and drugs is just a recipe for disaster. I saved a drum machine. I 
just got like a little sample and we just mess about like in here in the bedroom. Just messing about. And we used to record on a cassette and play it at warehouse, like in Leeds. And, uh, like one night, like Warp were there in like the warehouse and they had like a demo cassette being played. And like, they went up to the DJ stand and, and uh, just said, you know, who's this? You know, like we met them, like went to someone's car and we just played them at all. Like, you know, the real lights, I just couldn't believe it. It was like an album, you know, two albums just like finished. And, like, we, ne we never even thought of, you know, releasing them. We just did them, you know, to play there because we used to know DJ. And, uh, like, they, they put it out, like, that info. Like, they said it's selling about 5,000 or something like that. That's what most, like, dance records used to sell. And, uh, like, it sold about 130,000 or something like that. And, like, we just couldn't believe it. You know, we just never even thought of doing that. Like, that week, like, smash it. And, uh, like the face, and like everyone were ringing up and we started flipping it. It's good, I mean, like we've got stuff in the bedroom because like when we go out to nightclubs and you come back about three in the morning or something like that, like you're just dying to do a record, then you know, like, say you've, and you're really in the mood, and like you can just do it, you know, like there. Because like normally you'd have to like book a studio or something, and you'd have to wait a week or something like that, and then you'd be lost in it. But it's really good, you know. Like you have to do it ahead of so it's like sleep. It's easy to make a, just any record, like just a rave record, like we sample, which is like great beats and stuff like that. But to make something like different, it's really hard. 